It was called um, chickens, <laughs> poultry, chicken <laughs> gossip, and pigeon news. <laughs> a guy named H. L. Chung was the uh, author of that column. We're talking about columns here today with Bob Siegel. He's a columnist for the Star Advertiser, and he writes books, and he, he writes a lot, and he has a tremendous wealth of stories and historical vignettes about uh, the, the islands. And, um, you know, uh, my, my feeling I wanted to express to you is that that's very important uh, for Hawaii to have an identity. Its identity is historic, and we need to stay in touch with that. Don't you agree? I think it tells us, you know, who we are today. It's not just something that happened to other people. If those things hadn't happened to other people, you and I wouldn't be sitting here right now talking about it. Yeah. Uh, we are the remnant of that history. And we're thrown into the world from those people and those events that happened in the past. And if those events hadn't happened... Life would be different now. Somebody else would be here, not us. <laughs> True. <laughs> so Rearview uh, Mirror is in the name of your column, anyway. And you have a lot of books, and there's one of them, just one of about 15 or 20 of them. I got five. Five. Okay, well, it seems to me to be 15 or 20. And this one is, this, which one is this now? This is book number five. I'm going through the colors of the rainbow. So I've gone red, yellow, green, blue, and now purple. Okay. What, what, what I'll do for number six, I haven't figured out. I'm sure you will, though. So what's this, what's what, this one about? What's number five about? Well, you know, they're all uh, of a similar vein. They're just different stories about Hawaii people, places, and companies. And I'm looking for a wow factor. I'm looking for something that the average person is going to go, wow, I had no idea. For instance, uh, you know that we have tunnels through uh, Haiku Valley over to Halava Valley, the H3. We've got Leaky Leaky Highway, which, by the way, they were going to call the Ka'ahumanu Highway <laughs> until Maui said we've already got that name on a highway. <laughs> and then the, there's the New Wanu ha uh, Highway, which they now call Poly Highway. Uh -huh. But they also considered putting highways through Manoa Valley, Palolo Valley, Aina Haina, Niu Valley, Kuuo'o, and Hawaii Kai, all were considered wow. valleys because the beautiful beaches that exist on the uh, Waimanalo side. You know, can you imagine six highways proposed that could have taken us to Waimanalo? It would have, it would have taken a lot of money to do that. And there yeah. was even a train that was proposed to come down from Kahuku, went to Punalu, and then J.B. Castle was going to bring it all the way down to Waimanalo and punch a hole through Manoa and bring it to Eva Lace. And you could ride a train around in a circle on Oahu. It would have been great, don't you think? It, it would have been. For would have tourists, been anyway. They would have had a great ride. It, uh, but can you imagine a train going through Manoa? <laughs> it would have wrecked Manoa as Manoa exists today. I, I don't think Manoa would be very happy with it. Yeah. Even Mayor Blaisdell in the 50s said, at some point, we're going to need a, a hole through the Ko'olau to Waimanalo. It's, it's just not now that he thought we should do that. Well, obviously, it's probably just never well. going to be done. That reminds me of Kaimuki. Kaimuki, 1922 or so. Mm -hmm. And there was a developer, and the developer was trying to sell lots. They were so cheap. They were, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars a lot. Five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. An acre on Wailai Avenue thank you. in the 1890s. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The price may have gone up a little bit by the 1920s. <laughs> I guess so. And, and there was, he was offering, uh, oh, there was a trolley up the hill there, you know, by the old theater. It came right up to the top of that, that hill and mm -hmm. then down the other side. And this was supposed to incentivize people to buy the lots. And there was a zoo where uh, Lilio Kalani, uh, Lilio Okalani, elementary school was right there and when it rained they found out that the zebra was actually a donkey <laughs> somebody had painted but we we actually had several zoos that were designed to attract people uh, leva heights in 1915 had a zoo uh, or at least there was the plans for a zoo the guy bought three wallabies that were a part of a circus coming through honolulu put them in a tent a dog attacked the tent and they escaped, and now we have colonies of wallabies in Kalihi and New Water really? Valleys. Yes. Even now, today? Yes, to oh this day. Goodness. Where do you get your material, Bob? You have so much of it. You know, it's, it's, it's about everything, and it, it has it's great depth and breadth. Where do you get it? Well, a lot of it comes from my readers. You know, Bob Krause, one of my predecessors at the paper, said if it wasn't for the telephone in his day, now it's email in my <laughs> okay. day, he said he would have run out of material a long time ago. And we have pictures of him on the phone talking to readers, you know, and writing things down or typing them on an old typewriter or making index cards for his system. But, uh, for instance, I, I was uh, told by some people about Pats at Punalu, which I'd never been to, but I've driven past a hundred times. Yeah. 
And so I went out there and met some people who have memorabilia from Pats at Punalu, and then I put an article in the paper last week about it, and I heard from Paul Masuoka, who was Masu's Massive Plate Lunch, and he said he got his start there. Fresh out of KCC, they hired him to be a weekend chef, kind of took him under their wing. He was 18 or 19 years old at the time. He shared, Iris uh, Halloran, Pat's husband, shared some of her recipes with him. He went to work for Spence Cliff, started a catering business, and then went into business as Masu's Massive Plate Lunch, where Walmart is today on Kamoku, and then it moved to the Liliha area <laughs> after that. And so I may write about him. And when I was looking into Pat's at Punalu, I came up across a guy called David at Punalu. Have you ever heard of that name before? David Ka'apu. Do you recognize the Ka'apu name? Yes. Uh, Kikoa was his son, a friend of mine. His daughter Carol's a friend of mine as well. And he wore a malu and a hat and nothing else. And he had a little Hawaiian village of his own out there on a three-acre site <laughs> where he uh, raised chickens and hogs, uh, pounded his own taro, uh, and, uh, and people would drive up the windward side. And he was the only place to stop in the 20s and 30s. And he would often come to the gate and explain what he was doing to people. And he became famous when FDR stopped there and got a tour of his farm uh, in, I think, 1934. You know, this, this history is uh, kind of nostalgic for people. Of course, there's a lot of people still alive remember, you know, back before statehood, back before, you know, the, the building boom and uh, the technological boom in our society where we copy so many things from the mainland, you know, the, the pure Hawaiiana things. And uh, you had mentioned before the show began that the, the newspaper has always had a his, historic writer, a history writer, mm -hmm. and you're, you're the last on a long line. Want to name some of the others? You mentioned Bob Krause. Well, we had three tailors. Lois Taylor, uh, who's uh, still around. I bumped into her recently at a garden club meeting. Uh, Clarice Taylor and Emma Taylor. Emma Taylor was a part Hawaiian woman who wrote about, uh, she wrote a thing called Little Tales All About Hawaii. Uh, which was, I think, 12 years long, and there's a stack of them this high in binders at the main library downtown. Uh, great stories. You know, for instance, I was looking for um, verification that there had been a Confederate flag that was created by Queen Liliu Okalani for Curtis Perry Ward, Victoria's husband, that he put over his bed, and I found it in one of her columns, Little Tales All About Hawaii. Uh, that's great. It, it defines us. This, the whole thing defines us. And we need to have this. We need to have the nostalgia. We need to have it to distinguish ourselves from any other place that's been paved over. You know, so it's great what you do. And it reminds me of a, an issue that I, that I think about. Uh, a few years ago, it was a movie called The Descendants. Uh, sure. with, you know, George, George Clooney, Clooney was in it. Yeah. Yeah. I was pretty good, you know, not great, but pretty good. And it was done by Hollywood. And I said to myself, gee, that's a story about Hawaii, about the rule against perpetuities, about the land passing, mm -hmm. you know, through mm -hmm. various uh, parts of the family. You know. um, <clears throat> but what, what interested me is that just as we have the story of the descendants, we have a thousand other stories, 10,000 other stories that are unique to Hawaii that you wouldn't find anywhere else. You cover those things. But I also think that your work, you know, your research and what you hear and speak about um, could be a movie, could be many movies, <laughs> and, and it could be more important than The Descendants. Don't you agree? Uh, you and I could be the stars of that there movie. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I, I got to mention this. So in the morning mail... Oh, I get... congratulations on your award, by the way. <laughs> thank I, you, I thank won this you. award, I think, three years ago, maybe it was four years this ago. This is the Small Business Advocate of the Year for Media and Journalism. It's a very yeah. prestigious it's Small Business Administration. I was one of the judges until last year for this award when I uh, took a break, and I think I'll go back next year. But uh, I, I congratulate you on uh, winning this award thank and following you, in my footsteps. Thank you. I'm delighted to follow in your footsteps. Big... What steps? When I retire from my column, you can take it over. <laughs> I used to write for the newspaper, but I never wrote the historical stuff that you write. Well, I didn't have the material. It'd take off on a tangent. There you go. You, you probably have tons of material from the show that would oh, make yeah. interesting stories. We have 8,500 videos out there somewhere <laughs> in the cloud, you know, and they're, and they're all different. They're all very, um, they're all very Hawaii, actually. Mm. So let's talk about the, let's talk about what what people were wearing on December 7th, 1941. I need to know. Well, you know, on, on December 7th of 2018, I was writing about what happened in 1941, and several of the articles I wrote about, people realized that a day, or sometimes even two days later, they were still wearing their pajamas. <laughs> in one case, uh, the guy that I wrote about uh, on uh, December 7th uh, of uh, this past year, 
And uh, in, in the latrine, when he saw the bombing, he jumped into an airplane, took off with two other guys, uh, two, uh, three airplanes in total. Uh, and it wasn't until two days later that he realized he was still wearing the pajamas that he had been wearing that morning. <laughs> he, was, he was seriously distracted from his clothing. <laughs> a lot of people didn't know. And, and a woman that I read, wrote uh, about last year uh, was found out at the end of the day that she was still wearing her nightgown from that morning, that she had gotten up, the bombing happened. This was at Schofield Barracks. She'd been running around helping people, jumping in and out of ditches. Uh, putting bandages on people, taking care of her children, and then late that night she realized, I'm still wearing my nightgown. Now, you know what, it tells you so much more than you could otherwise read in the history book to know that. It means that people were so focused on what was going on, they were so traumatized, they were so in the moment, they weren't, they weren't thinking about their clothing. One of the cutest stories is there was a, a soldier, uh, last name Taylor, at uh, Schofield Barracks. Another Taylor. Barracks. Another Taylor. Another Taylor <laughs> who got into a plane wearing the tuxedo he had worn the night before and had never changed out of. They had stayed all up all night. It was a late night, cards. yeah. He had rented it from a Korean woman, he said, in Wahiwa, who told him if he got it dirty, he would have to pay for it. And he was flying, chasing zeros, and he shot the first one down of the war. Uh, over Wahiwa, and uh, one of the Japanese planes shot at him, and he got a little blood on his tuxedo. And he thought, which is worse, the Japanese shooting at me or having to face that Korean woman? He decided he'd rather face the Japanese. She probably yelled at him and took his deposit. <laughs> he, he said, I don't remember if I ever returned that tuxedo. I'd like to frame it right now. So many things. Um, okay, I wanted to talk about, oh, gee, um, how about the big yellow taxi references? Well, you know, I love uh, Joni story Mitchell. About that. They pay Paradise, put up a parking lot. Well, there's several references in it to places in Hawaii. So, for instance, they took all the trees, put them in a, a tree museum. Where's that? A tree, the Arboretum? Up, up in Manoa? Uh, not, the Ar not Lion Arboretum. Good guess. You're warm. Foster Botanical Garden oh, sure. is sure. the tree museum that she was talking about. Yes. Uh, Actually created by the first chief physician at Queen's Hospital, Hospital William Hillebrand was his name, who thought we could trade trees and shrubs and bushes and flowering plants between South America, Hawaii, and Asia. And we, he created a triangle of these going back and forth. After 20 Great years, idea. he left Hawaii, sold it to his place to Mary Foster, who donated it to the city. Thus, Foster Gardens. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, Foster Botanical Gardens. Uh, Joni Mitchell wrote about uh, a pink hotel. Oh, the Royal Hawaiian. A boutique, which we don't know, and a swing and hot spot. What was the swing and hot spot around 1970? Do you re remember? We have an idea of what she was talking about. A nightclub. A spats was the name spats. of it. Spats. I remember the Bag name, but I was Bag never Bag there about uh, Bagwell. Uh, Next to Bagwell's 2424 at the oh, Bagwell's uh, 24. That was a great place. That was that in in or around it was, Bagwell? It was in the same tower, but it was, I think, a floor below. Uh, okay, okay. But yeah. uh, Joni Mitchell wrote about the Tree Museum on her website, uh, and uh, there are theories about the other places. Certainly the Royal Hawaiian would be the Pink Hotel. But a lot of people hear that song. It was her biggest hit, and yet they don't realize she's making references to Hawaii. <laughs> Let's talk about sports. Sure. You tell me about the interesting origin of sports uh, in Hawaii. And uh, let's see, it was, uh, it was Luther Gulick. And I know Ray Gulick, who is a descendant of Luther Gulick. Yeah? Uh, Luther Gulick was the son of missionaries. His father was a, a surgeon, a missionary surgeon. And he went to uh, the mainland. I think he graduated from Puno about 1875. He went to the mainland. He became the head of the YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts, and he noticed that his staff was getting out of shape in the wintertime. They were supposed to do calisthenics, but it was a boring thing to do. So he asked his students and co-workers to come up with sports that could be played indoors in a gym. And one of them came up with basketball, and the other came up with volleyball, originally called Minuton, as it reminded him of badminton. But uh, Luther Gulick, uh, a local boy played a role. Now, obviously, we know surfing began in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, the, thir the fourth sport that we have a connection to is baseball. Alexander Joy Cartwright moved to Hawaii within five years of creating the sport of baseball on the mainland. He lived the rest of his life in the islands. 
I remember, I remember that, and, and after this break, I'm going to tell you why I remember that. But well, we're going to take a break now because uh, we can't just sit here and talk. We have to go uh, do some exercise. We're going to do that for a minute, and we'll come right back with Bob Siegel. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. I'm live at five every Wednesday where we have entertaining and educational conversations that are real and relevant, both here in Hawaii and across the globe. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Oahu Cemetery, and she's a cemetery this is Nanette expert. Napoleon. Nanette Napoleon. Her yeah. father was uh, on the jury for the Massey case uh, wow. in the 30s. He had stories to tell. Yeah, you? I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, wow. So I, I, I was going to tell you that I, I became aware of uh, the, the whole basket baseball thing mm -hmm. uh, through the Cartwright family because every year, it's usually in the summer, I think, the Mission House Museum. Who have they have uh, a couple of researchers up there that are very good, mm -hmm. and they've been on the show as a matter of fact, um, and they and they put on these uh, little one actor plays about people who are buried in Oahu Museum, and you, you walk around from tent to tent, and each tent is a different actor and a different wow, person. Wow, that sounds very exciting. It is. It's great. And, I'd uh, love to do it. Yeah. Uh, it, well, keep your eye peeled for that. Mission House Museum uh, every summer. And it's, it's, stuff, it's stuff that you would really like. Wow. And the right. viewers as well. Yeah, it's very yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, the Oahu Cemetery is our most artistic uh, cemetery. It's Victorian art. It's grand. It's, it's grandiose. It's, it's beautiful stuff. It's part of that, it's part of that um, you know, nostalgic uh, legacy that we have, and we, we should treasure it. And I appreciate that you do what you do, and, and they, their researchers do what they do. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's alive, you know, it's still alive. Mm -hmm. It's not just a question of looking back to the overthrow and all that. It's the whole 19th century. Those were the days of e extraordinary events and mm -hmm. transitions. And, and those transitions, uh, you know, continue until statehood. Mm -hmm. So talk to me more about your stories. Um, let's see, what I liked was, um, yeah, the uh, New Uwanu uh, YMCA, there's a story there. Uh, the original New Uwana YMCA was the idea of a guy named Lloyd Killiam, who was an assistant secretary of the YMCA in the 1920s. And it was, Nationally? Uh, no, here in Hawaii. Okay. And at the time, on one night, on a Friday night, he had to drive from the Chinese YMCA to the Japanese YMCA to the Korean YMCA to the uh, Filipino YMCA, and it started raining. He's, where, he's running, uh, driving an old Model T Ford, <laughs> which was not very uh, secure. He got soaked, and he says, why don't we put all these Ys in one place? Now, that was 150 years, excuse me, 150 years ago, we started the YMCA. The new Wanu YMCA was the idea from this rainy, wet night that he had. It opened up in 1918, 101 years ago. We're going to have a special next week in the Star Advertiser about the YMCA's in general. Uh -huh. But the new one of YMCA was the first multicultural YMCA in the country. There was one in Kansas City that was black and white. But this was four different nationalities, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, and Filipinos. And at the time, we were concerned that Japan had invaded and was occupying Korea. And we weren't sure the Koreans would get along with the Japanese in Hawaii, but they, they all got along with each other. CKIE, who was the founder of City Mill, was representing the uh, Chinese in that. Syngman Rhee, the former president of Korea, was representing the Koreans there. Uh, we had people representing the Filipinos, people representing the, uh, the Japanese, Ige Mori, uh, the doctor here in Hawaii. Uh, it was a success, and a lot of people don't realize the new Wanu YMCA, which, by the way, started in what is now the new uh, the Vineyard and uh, Poly Highway Long Safeway parking lot. That's where it was originally. Wow, it wasn't until I think sixty-one lot, you know, I think. that they moved across the street uh, to bigger facilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was a first attempt to bring four different races together in the YMCA, and it was a model for the entire country after its success. And that's that's Hawaii. We did that effortlessly. 
And it was a great statement. It still is a great statement. Well, you know, it would make sense that if we did that in the 60s, but we did it 50 years earlier than that. Yeah. And it, it worked in 1918. The why, the why itself is an important part of Hawaii history, don't you think? I mean, I'm glad the paper's writing this up. I, I, are you writing part I of it? I wrote two articles for it. I don't know how many there will be, but I'm going to guess 8 to 10 or 15 yeah. articles. I mean, the why has been, uh, oh, God, there's so many great stories. I mean, how about the... Uh, <clears throat> The, the, the military why, the armed forces why. Uh, sure, that took over from where the Royal Hawaiian Hotel had been downtown on Alakea Richards. Uh, I, I've seen hotel pictures streets. of that, yeah. Uh, and it, it was a place that, you know, Hotel Street was like the main drag for people, in, and it was a drag in, in <laughs> Literally different Literally was ways. a drag, in the fullest sense of the word as we use it today. <laughs> yes, uh, for some of our military personnel, it gave them a place to hang out. Uh, and one of the more interesting things about the Armed Services YMCA is after Harry Truman had left office, he came to Hawaii to pay a visit to uh, the governor of Hawaii, and he stayed a week or two at uh, Coconut Island in Kaneohe Bay. And while he was meeting with the governor, he said, you know, is there a place I can get a haircut? And the two of them walked across the street from the palace, where the governor was at the time, to the y Armed Forces YMCA where his barber was, and he waited in line with everybody else at the <laughs> YMCA to get a haircut there. <laughs> And there was a there was a women's Y in uh, Manoa somewhere in Upper Moila. Ely. Are you thinking of uh, Fernhurst? Yes, I am. Fernhurst. Uh, I've been researching that. It, Fernhurst. Th there was a, a house called Fernhurst, uh, the cook home where the you know where the bus barn is at King and Alapai Street yes. that's going up right now. Yes. Uh, that's where Fernhurst originally was, and it and it referred to the lush foliage of that place. Uh, after they decided to move from that house, they donated to the YMCA, which made it into a Fernhurst YMCA. And then the Alapai bus barn expanded and took over the property. But before they uh, could build a bus barn on the site, they built a bowling alley. It became City Bowl. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, in the 50s and 60s, there was a bowling alley on that site. Uh, meanwhile, it moved to the corner of, I believe it was uh, Makiki and uh, Punahou, right across from Punahou School where there had been a Pleasanton Hotel, which was famous in the 1920s and 1930s, and that's where the Fernhurst YMCA is today. A, a friend of mine, deceased, deceased, deceased now, <clears throat> came here and stayed at that Fernhurst, and she had pictures of that Fernhurst, and it was a grand uh, circle of palm trees out in the mm -hmm, front. Mm -hmm. It looked like royalty. It looked, oh, it was a beautiful house. It was house. a beautiful place, yeah. And, and uh, you know, this, this takes me to, you know, the whole thing about the, the why is, is it's emblematic of the development of Hawaii, the democratization of Hawaii coming off the plantations. Uh, you know, it was something for everyone. It was very important, and in a funny way, it's still important. You know, just uh, last week, two weeks ago, there was an article in the Times um, about uh, Julia Morgan. Sure, who designed the YWC on Richard Street. So I it took my, my brother was here, and I took him for lunch at Cafe Julia. Yes. I was able to hold forth. Yes. <laughs> about, you know, Julia Morgan as an architect and mm -hmm. how this all came to be. But it, it's a classic building. It's so important. I hope people realize that. It is a beautiful building. And she was the first female architect in Hawaii and created this building 100 years ago, and it's still in great shape. And she was also a famous architect on the mainland. She created some of the buildings at Mills College in the Oakland Bay Area. Yeah. That was all in the article, actually, in the Times. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, oh. <clears throat> the Longs, speaking of uh, the Longs Poly area mm -hmm. and the, the Y there across the way, uh, the Longs Poly logo, what was that about? Well, you know, uh, interestingly, I ran across uh, when they opened that Longs in 1961, and I didn't know that every Longs back then had an individual logo. Now, if they were in a shopping center, they used the shopping center's logo, like all the Ala Moana Center Longs had the Ala Moana Center logo. But if they were not part of one, for instance, the one downtown on Hotel and Bishop Street uh -huh. has uh, the Aloha Tower as its logo. Uh -huh. uh, and they created a logo of a Hawaiian tiki god uh, named Ma'oli, which is a god, a god or tiki of medicine. And it's still in the sign for the entrance off of uh, Ford Street and Kukui Street in that area there. On, there's a two-sided sign at the very top of it. It's a, the logo is about this big of a Hawaiian tiki. They phased all these tikis out in their ads, or probably around 1980, 85 or so. They stopped giving them to every store. 
that open, but it's a remnant of the past that I find really interesting. You know, I'm thinking, you know, you know so much about so many places, you know, geographical places. It reminds me of Steven Spielberg. Um, he invented something, designed something back in the, the aught years uh, called Talking Streets. <clears throat> Talking Streets, you, you'd walk down a street and there'd be a brass plaque on a house and it mm -hmm. would say, are you interested in this house? Uh, Susan B. Anthony lived in this house. Mm -hmm. So dial this number and you'll hear about Susan B. Anthony. Mm. So you take your cell phone out, you dial the number. It's a radio play about things that happen in this house. And, I, you know, Sony, Sony Corporation has been here a long time. They have a special affinity for Hawaii. They were thinking about a similar arrangement here. Uh, you could make a map, essentially, or a geographical, you know, contact point. Uh, pin the tail on the location kind of place just like that, don't you think? You know, one of my visions has been to create a timeline of brass plaques along Kalakaua Avenue that might start in the 1500s or the 1400s, you know, as far back as we can know anything that happened. For instance, the first fish ponds were created in Waikiki around the 1400s. And we could take it up through the royal period. We could have plaques for the kings and queens and some of the things they did. And, you know, every king and queen that Hawaii had, except for Kamehameha II, left something around that is still here today doing good work. You know, for instance, Queen Emma created the Queen's Hospital. She created St. Andrew's Priory, Iolani School, a couple of other places as well. Lilio Kalani created a, a home for children. Luna Lilo created a home for senior citizens. Kalakaua. Uh, did thing you know every single one of them left things that are still around today except for Kamehameha II who died at a very young age of smallpox in London. This this could this I love this idea because this idea could make uh, Hawaii at least Honolulu a, a living treasure of historic uh, moments and um, you know lessons and, uh, and not only the things that are visible still today like Ilani Palace is mm -hmm. there's a treasure trove in there but <clears throat> things that are no longer there on this spot this happened. You know, on somewhere on, uh, you probably know the story, somewhere on, uh, was it um, Merchant Street, uh, Thomas Edison came around and played his, his first movie right here in Hawaii. Unbelievable. Yeah, he was the first person to shoot a movie in the islands. I think it was around 1898. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's worth a brass plaque right there. I mean, this place, this city would be bristling with Bob Siegel brass plaques everywhere. I'd like to collaborate with you on that. Bob. Okay. You know, there's a, a missing brass plaque that really bugs me, and that is on the Blaisdell Center area. There are several brass plaques, but none talk about the Ward family that lived there. That's a huge story. Can you believe that? A huge story. And unfortunately, you know, it's being paved over. So much <laughs> is being paved over. So we, we rely on you to keep these memories alive. <laughs> you and I will do it together. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Any of your viewers who are interested in participating in that, we invite you to join us as well. Sure, we have we other hosts too. Let me, let me spend our remaining time here. Uh, the Royal School, talk about schools, was founded in 1839. Um, Kamehameha III yeah. uh, asked uh, the uh, missionaries to create a school for the children of Ali'i. And uh, so the, the first children, it was called the Chief's Children's School. It was about where the state capitol is today, on the grounds of Iolani Palace. Uh, in, that was 1839. And they did that two years before they founded Punahou, which was for their own children. So it's interesting to me that they created a school for the children of Ali'i before the, they created one for their own children. But 1839 is an important anniversary. It's 180 years ago this year, so that's a significant deal. Yeah. By 1850, they had graduated all their students, including Kalakaua, Lilio Okalani, Miriam Liki Liki, Bernice Pawahi, Kamehameha III, and fourth, William Luna Lilo. And they moved to the current location that they have today at the top of Punchbowl Street. And School Street is named for the Royal School. Oh, not for, not for Kamehameha up the hill then? No. It, it started at where Punchbowl is and Royal, and uh, where Royal School is. It slowly moved toward Kalihi. At one point, it was just two blocks long. It went to where Fort Street is, in, which is now Poly Highway. And there was another school at the corner of School Street and Fort Street. What was its name? I give up. McKinley High School. Oh, sure. Well, it was the Fort Street School at the time. Fort Street School. That's a and long way it, off from so Fort Street we now. Have, that's why School Street has that name. There were two schools. It was two blocks long. <laughs> you know, you've you got to make brass plaques, I tell you. Because it's, it's a moving target. 
I mean, when you learn about the history of one particular institution, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same place, you know, as the final destination or the current destination of that institution. Mm -hmm. You know, Bob, we're going on a, on a trip uh, in 10 days' time around uh, Elani Palace. I haven't even started packing. <laughs> you should come. We, we, we have, we have a, a docent who's going to take us to the attic. Oh, no kidding. The attic. Wow, Iolani that Palace. sounds interesting. I've and done a tour of Iolani Palace, but not the attic. Yeah, the attic is, is it, you know, they say every museum has, uh, you know, like an iceberg. You only see like one-eighth of the collection. Well, there's an extraordinary sure. collection in the attic of Iolani Palace. You know, I was there two weeks ago. Uh, a friend of mine was on a tour, and I was picking her up. And a group of school kids was outside the back of the palace, and they started singing. There was a, somebody playing ukulele, and all these kids sang. The docents were standing at the top of the steps, and they chanted back to these kids before they entered. It was really beautiful. Oh, yeah, beautiful guy. We, we have that. You know, mm -hmm. we have it. We, it's a great tradition we have, and we have to keep it alive. And, and I think, don't you agree, that <clears throat> the challenge is ever greater because we are getting paved over and we're forgetting, and the idea is to try to remember. Sure. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. And that's why I write a column every week to try and uh, capture some of this history before we have lost it. And that's why people write to you and tell you about other stories. That's why you have such a following, Bob. Yes, and I would have run out of material a long time ago if it wasn't for readers sharing their stories with me. <laughs> Thank you, Bob Siegel, an author, a columnist, um, and a great, a great student of Hawaii. Thank Thanks you so for much. having me on the show. Aloha.